And my talk is about mitochondria and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And uh, I will, to start right away, you heard already how important calcium is in muscle pathophysiology. And the idea that mitochondrial calcium overload could be a factor in cell necrosis and muscle diseases goes back to Klaus Krogman, to the best of my knowledge. This is in the first issue of The Lancet, 1976. What is it about? The idea is that many things can converge and it can be any of those reasons that you see there. This is the original scheme of Klaus. Um, ended up, end up in a sarcolemmal defect. And the idea is, and this includes, of course, muscular disease, that the defects cause an increase in net influx of calcium. And this is initially compensated. And part of the compensation is mitochondrial calcium uptake. The problem is that too much calcium induces a functional damage, which is then later um, followed by a structural damage. I'll, I'll tell you more about this part. When this happens now, lack of energy means less ATP, less pumping out of calcium, less ER, S, S, SR mitochondria interactions. And in the end, this causes a further increase of, of, of calcium overload. In the end, these, these elevated levels of cytoplasmic calcium <clears throat> will cause hypercontracture and cell necrosis. And I've been interested in this for many, many years, particularly in trying to assess whether this damage is due to the so-called permanent transition pore. You heard already about it yesterday in Russ Heppel's talk. I won't need much more, but the answer is simple. I think the answer is yes. And you can find <clears throat> an overall review, which is dedicated to Klaus Rogman, by the way, 40 years later, um, all, all the evidence that, include, uh, that, that, that involves um, um, the transition pore in, in mitochondrial damage. Uh, what is it? You heard it already. It's an inner membrane channel that when open for a long time, and the key is matrix calcium, but also the usual suspects like oxidants can cause uh, mitochondrial swelling with the uh, breakdown of the outer membrane, release of cytochrome C and other proapoptotic factors, including AIF, as you heard. And one point I want to stress, because it's going to become very important in a few minutes, NAD is also lost. And when this happens, respiration goes down. This is a key point in my presentation. Don't forget this issue. How much of the damage in muscular dystrophy is due to decreased respiratory capacity? You might have a spare muscle that can't work because it can't breathe. Remember this. Then you also heard the issue of short openings, flickering, that might be involved in calcium homeostasis. And that's a hypothesis we put forward like 1996 for the first time. And I want to stress that the basis for the flickering is then prevailing factors that close the pore like ADP magnesium. So it's a struggle, you know, that's why the flickering goes on. This is, I believe, very important. It's too bad I don't have the time to go into this. This is the first paper showing that impaired flickering can cause a genetic disease. And this is spastic paraplegia. And this is just published in Biomedicine, which is the Biomedical Journal of the Lancet. And it's a group of Giorgio Casari. I contributed to this. I'm very proud because we also have potential therapy with the benzodiazepine, which increases the open time of the pore. And it's like a mimic of cyclophilin D. So take a look at this paper. I think it's, a, it's, it's the first ever. This is the first disease of impaired flickering. So what do we know about the molecular nature? I will not tell you anything about this. I want to go to muscular dystrophy. You already heard that perhaps there are two, not just one channel responsible for this. And these are the FATP synthase, which I think we discovered and I believe is key, but also the adenine nucleotide translocator. And what's weird is that they are both stimulated by cyclophilin D and they're both inhibited by cyclosporin, which makes for a mess. And we are trying to sort that out. And uh, as I say, the contribution of each is the matter of active investigation. So back here, last point I want to make, the most widely used inhibitor is cyclosporin A. And there is a problem, a set of problems actually. Well, first and foremost, cyclosporin A is immune suppressive and you don't want to use that in muscular dystrophies, particularly in those that involve the respiratory system. <clears throat> 
Second problem, there is a receptor in the matrix for cyclosporin, and that's called cyclophilin D. That's the only target in mitochondria. And the problem is this is a soluble protein. So calcium activates, magnesium inhibits, and cyclophilin D is guilty by association. So the idea is that by binding to the components of the pore, this favors the open state. And cyclosporin works by preventing this interaction. But the point is, calcium goes up, the pore can still open, magnesium and ADP go down. So the problem is the effect is not the, the blocking effect, it's, it's the desensitization. So we looked for better and new pore inhibitors. And the program was funded by the NIH to Michael Forde and myself as co-PIs. This is a few years back. And the key person was Justina Silekite. She, she was my longtime co-worker here in Padova. Then she moved to Michael Forte's lab. And we did the screening of the NIH library at the Sanford Burnham Institute in La Jolla and uh, directed by, at the time at least, by T.C. Chang and Michael Hedrick was our hand there. And um, the first screening was done by Justina in a, in a week about. And, and, and then Sudeshna Roy and Frank Schoenen at UCANSAS were able to do the structure activity relationship. We did hundreds of compounds that were screened here in Padova. And we came up with two new classes. One is the isoxazoles, the other is phenylbenzamides. So what do they do? This is a way of measuring the effectiveness of an inhibitor of the pore by measuring how much calcium you need to take up before the pore opens, which is this precipitous release. So the more pulses, the more effective the inhibitor is. This is cyclosporin. This is one of our best isoxazoles. And this is the additivity because these isoxazoles work even in the absence of cyclophilin. So they're very good. They don't rely on the soluble. And these were developed further. This is isoxazole 63, which is what uh, Russ Heppel used in his experiments. And the problem was effective, yes, but very unstable. And the liability turned out to be the very isoxazole group. So now Michael Cohen stepped in and he realized that he could substitute the isoxazole with a triazole. And now the compound is extremely stable. And it's extremely active still. This is nanomolar, 29 nanomolar for half inhibition in isolated mitochondria. Pretty good. This is one of the best on the market. So the idea is, can we use this compound to try and see whether we can cure uh, models of the muscular dystrophy? We did not use MDX mice for many reasons. And one of the reasons is the disease is too mild. We wanted something severe and we choose the SEPG zebrafish. This was developed in Tübingen by, uh, by mutagenesis, random, and then it was screened and the trunk muscles were affected and animals died early. And it turned out that the lesion was a point mutation, the DMD exon 4. Remember that in SEPG, it's not, it, this is autosomal. Okay, so it's, it's a Mendelian inheritance, uh, it's a recessive phenotype. Um, it's clearly a dystrophy and it's the most severe model I know of. And this is the characterization of Bassett and Curry. You can see the test fibers. This is a constitutive GFP expressing animal. You don't need GFP, you can do polarized light. This is a wild type of zebrafish, nice polarization and this is the SEPG. This is a good way of distinguishing the homozygotes for further study because you have to cross the heads, of course. So the question really is, can, can you show that these uh, animals have a mitochondrial dysfunction in vivo? This has never been achieved. It's very hard to do. And we set out to monitor this. You can see the morphological abnormalities here. The arrows are regions of fibrosis in the subgenus zebrafish. We went for tetrametyrhodamine methyl ester. This is a lipophilic probe that ends up in mitochondria because they're very electronegative. So respiring energized mitochondria stain with this probe and these are living animals, okay? And you can see this intracellular pattern of staining and these are mitochondria. So the SAPG didn't take up the probe. This is in situ mitochondrial dysfunction. And what's more, we can recover 
with the treatment with TRO1. This is one micromolar. We want to be more precise. So Marco Schiavone did this contour study and then studied each fiber pixels and you can recover a membrane potential which is very close to the membrane potential of the wild types. So yes, there is a mitochondrial dysfunction and can be rescued by treatment. What do I need? What do I mean with treatment? We start at 48 hours post fertilization and we treat for a day and then you do the measurements. So this is quite rapid in terms of, of the effect. And when I talk about measurement, I mean treatment, that's what I mean, unless otherwise stated. But the key quick question is respiration. So this is what we do. This is a seahorse eyelet plate. So the little fellow is down here, very happy inside the plate. And he's uh, or she or it is respiring, um, can swim because we want to keep it with the grid. But bottom line, it's a beautiful experiment, I think. So this is based on respiration, oligomycin inhibits, which means they are making ATP with the respiration, uncoupler pushes respiration to a maximum and it's mitochondrial because it's inhibited by rotin and antimycin A. Now, are you ready? How about the Sabji? The poor guy is, you know, not doing very well. Basal respiration is half the wild type. Very little ATP is being made. You can tell the effect of oligomycin and no respiratory reserve. So this is respiratory defective. I'm going now, actually Marco did this, and Anastoko to titrate in our major compound. Look at this, 100 nanomolar in the water. And this is the time course one and 10. So concentration dependence, both basal means they're making ATP again and, and maximal. I think this is truly remarkable. It's a single treatment which, re which restores respiration to the wild type levels. Then of course you look for structure. There is a basis for this, yes. The refringence is re-established and this is again the time course. You look for function, these fish start swimming again. And this is overnight with the Daniel Vision system. They go even higher than the wild types. And then the key question, is this going to improve survival? So this would be your wild type. In this case, uh, the SEBG natural curve as observed in the original e experiments when they generated the, the, the animals, they don't survive beyond a couple of weeks. Not a single animal is alive at that time. Now we give, this is a double dose. So we repeat it because as the, the, the half time is or the order of less than one day, we figured we do a second addition and then nothing else. So this is repeated. 100 nanomolar in the fish water, and you see that uh, the effect is pretty remarkable. This is the dose dependence. Please note this is a hundredfold range, so it's effective between 01 and 10, and no toxic effects. This is a dream from the pharmacodynamics point of view because once you reach the the, the threshold, it's very unlikely to be lost. So. Uh, and I tell you, I've never seen anything like that. this. We, we have done previous experiments with cyclophilin inhibitors, and you're the first in the world to see the experiments. They, never, they were never presented outside of our lab. So back to the survival course, a curve, we kept some of them. Now we have individuals that are 45 days old. These are young adults. And Patrizia Sabatelli did an interesting experiment here. This is collagen six, just to mark the fiber. And you can tell the fiber size and uh, pattern is indistinguishable now from the wild type. These are young adults, remember. And you never see this if you let them go because it's lethal. So I even wonder, could they be re-expressing this trophy or could this be a mistake? I shouldn't say this. I hope Mark is not listening. He's so good. That was not an issue. But here you go. There's no dystrophy whatsoever. So we have young adults completely devoid of dystrophy. They are alive and kicking. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share these results. Then, of course, the key question is, well, who cares about fish, right? I have a minute left. Yes, sir. I'm almost done. Is this relevant to Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And I don't know, honest, but 
if you study in vitro myoblasts and then myotubes induced to differentiate and you measure respiration much the way you did for the fish. So basal means ATP link maximal is with the uncoupler. And then we used uh, some uh, very nice cell lines that we got from Vincent Mouly in Paris. And this is again treated for 24 hours. The myoblasts already have a better ATP yield, I would say, because respiration basal is, is in, improved. Myotubes, all of them, and even maximal respiration, in this case, it's double. So this is all we have when it comes to, to humans. But I believe this is extremely promising. And um, so we have some hope for the future. And going back to biopsies from patients, this is a beautiful EM of Patricia. You, I, I know you've seen this if you do in the clinics, disrupted mitochondria with lesions, you know, like herniations and swelling. Of course, the question has always been, is this cause or consequence? And what I'm trying to tell you is this could be part of the cause in the sense of the amplification loop. So in the end, going back to the great idea of Klaus Frogman, I think, yes, probably this functional damage, which is then becomes structural, is due to poor opening. And this would be the, the, the vicious circle of ATP depletion that leads to death. And the evidence is all of these things ameliorate the phenotype in all the models we have tested. I don't know about the transient openings, but the last entry is TRO1. And the beauty is that a mitochondrial therapy would complement any anti-inflammatory, genetic stem cell-based strategies. It's a different target. So I hope to see this developed in combination with with, with all the current attempts. And with this, I want to acknowledge Anna Stocco, grad student, Natalia Smolina, postdoc, Eduardo Artuzzi. He was a master student and they were supervised for the zebrafish work by a great uh, colleague, Marcus Chiavona, who is now an assistant professor in Brescia. Patrizia Sabatelli, she's a great histopathology sample collection, electron microscopy, although I didn't have the time to show all of it. Justina is now an associate in Michael Cohen's lab, and she is in Portland with Mike Forte as well, and she's developing the drugs further, and Vincent Mouly provided us with uh, cells, which means expertise, because these are um, cells, well-characterized cells from patients. And with this, I want to acknowledge Teleton and Fondation Le Duc in particular, and thank you for your attention. Great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question? Yeah, I, I do have a question. So you, you haven't looked to see if you abolish the transient openings that you think are important for, for normal function? Uh, the problem is it's hard to, to know, and we don't know yet. Um, these drugs work at the past clamp, and we are just doing what you're saying, trying and see whether short openings are still possible. But this is in the works. You know, I, I privileged the muscle part. There are many clinicians here. I thought it was more interesting, but um, it, it's a long way to go. Now it's on statistics, if you know what I mean. You need to do mm -hmm. hundreds of recordings before you have an answer. That's why I left it blank. I just don't know. I hope it's not going to be affected because that could be detrimental. But it looks like in these patients, in these fish, and possibly in the patients, the problem is too much opening. So for the moment, we want to prevent that from happening. That's the, the goal or the hope. So Paulo, related to that question that Lee just asked. So am I correct in thinking that even with this TR001? agent and perhaps other analogs that you folks are looking at, you can still achieve permeability transition with a sufficient stimulus? Uh, that's a hope, you know? Okay. And it's hard to temper with something so fundamental. And it's, it's a new concept that in fact, even inhibiting could be a problem. That's why I pulled out this, this, this paper. And I really think this is going to be of some concern in the end, but so far, what we have in the living animal is extremely suggestive of a good effect, provided the disease is due to too much opening. But 
No, we can do these things to assess the effect on the open time. And that's time, well, maybe, maybe not me, I'm getting too old for that, but it's going to be done one day. Thank you. Paolo, did you, um, did you check uh, the membrane integrity, maybe under exercise, or do you know if the membrane is more stable with this treatment? You know, I would expect that to happen as a secondary consequence of the normalization of calcium homeostasis, but we have not done that yet. And I'm about to buy, I, I've seen it yesterday, and I'm already placing the order for the tunnel. So thank you, whomever presented the tunnel for the fish. That's a way also of, of measuring the bioenergetics. So sure enough, we'll do this. And uh, if you're interested, Feliciano, anyone can have the drug. Just write to... to yeah. Write to me and, and then you re, I'll redirect you. The more information we get on the potential effects, the better it will be. Maybe even in the, in the ocular pharyngeal thing, you, I was intrigued when you said mitochondrial effect and maybe there is some of that there too. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs>